Okay, so thank you for coming to the seminar today. Our speaker today is uh, Sasha Wamaya. She work at Mercury and CIUE. She's going to talk about some of the challenges in this. But the advances slides have to be on yours. <laughs> Yeah, just a quick reminder, uh, our next seminar is in three weeks. This is going to be a joint seminar with the seminar. The introduction of our speaker today, Sasha uh, just retired from Sitchin as an adjunct professor at UC Berkeley, East West. Director of Research Group Research at CIE, student for This is affiliated with She was also a faculty scientist at Lawrence Berkeley. Work has been driven by the vision of a She has led to the development of the she has written a book in power system uh, called the electric power systems a conceptual introduction second edition just came out in thank you so much in have to stop sharing or I will just yeah, I will continue. I will share my screen and go, go into full screen mode. Great, it works. Well, it's so nice to be here in civilization with you. Uh, this is a picture from my neighborhood. I took that photo literally on the way from my house down to the grocery store. Uh, this is in the eastern Sierra outside of uh, very importantly, we have Mount Emerson, Mount Humphreys, and Basin Mount. Oh, there's also power lines. Um, there is the Pacific DC uh, intertie is the one with the two conductors, and then a regular 230 kV uh, AC line with the three conductors. Um, we have interesting infrastructure up there, a bunch of hydro development, uh, which is why they built roads to where I live, so I like it. Um, uh, the title, I'm going a little on a stretch here. Curveball is a metaphor from baseball. Uh, having grown up in Germany, soccer is much more intuitive to me. Uh, baseball is a strange game, right? You're supposed to hit a ball that they throw at you to make it really hard to hit, but not impossible to hit. Um, when I throw a ball in the backyard, um, you can... Calculate the flight path of this ball with freshman physics, right? It's just a ballistic object under the influence of gravity. When a major league pitcher throws a ball, that model, that physics model of just velocity and gravity no longer works very well because the turbulence in the aerodynamics comes into play when the ball is really fast and it's spinning or spinning. And you see laminar flow, uh, breaking down with turbulence and so forth. So it makes the ball go in unexpected ways to make it harder to hit. The analogy here, well, and the weird thing about baseball, too, is all the interesting stuff happens where you can't really see it. So I always thought baseball was really boring, but there's actually interesting physics. It's just hard to see on television. Um, kind of like electricity. You can't see the wires and around with the magnetic fields and stuff. Um, but the, the analogy here is that modern grids have some different physics that comes into play. And the traditional way of understanding the system and how it works will no longer be apt for describing and understanding and predicting behaviors in modern grids. And uh, electric power understand uh, since the time they were built in the late 1880s 
Uh, one of my PhD advisors, a political scientist, uh, Todd Laporte, had the great um, quote, the electric grid is a system that works in practice, not in theory. I see a raised hand on the Zoom. Is that a question? Can you check on that, Jin Wu? Um, is the audio working for the people online? Is the video working for the people online? Um, I'll ask. That was. What's that? That was my question. Oh, that was your question to them. Okay. Um, I'll just keep talking. Um, so the, the thing is that the electric grid comprises a very large number of different interact over different time scales, over short and long distances. And there is nobody no human and no computer who can account for the entirety of the system at any given time and completely understand everything that's going on. That is actually one definition of a complex system. Uh, people have learned how to keep the lights on in practice, not by having a complete understanding of this, which is, again, the same way that a batter can actually hit a baseball not because they can write down all the equations for how, an, how a spinning object flows through the air, uh, but be, because of practice and learning and a lot of uh, repetition. So um, these different ways of knowing about a complex system, analytically through equations, or heuristically and empirically through practice uh, is actually what I did my uh, dissertation work on over 30 years ago uh, about contrasting engineering and operator cultures. Um, a complex system is capable of surprises. And the interesting, yes. Can I take off the slide preview? Oh, um, I guess they're seeing what's on my laptop. They're not seeing what's on the screen. Um, I can swap displays, but I, let's see. How is that working? Better? Um, so um, we've had electric grids since the 80s. Uh, they, there were not computers nor pocket calculators back in the day. Um, raise your hand if you learned how to use one of these in school. Okay. Um, this is an analog device for calculating how old you are. If you learned how to use one of these in school, you're over 60. Um, so this is a slide rule um, where that allows you to do... Uh, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, exponentiation, trig functions. Um, and until pocket calculators got around in the 1970s, this is how people did math, right? So we've had electric grids longer than that. And by necessity, the way that we design and analyze and understand electric grids had to be amenable to doing the math with tools that people had, right? So the standard power engineering curriculum is full of simplifying assumptions, approximations, um, ways to make the math tractable and to make the system conceptually tractable. And when you actually build it and operate it, there are rules of thumb for how to make it work. And there's extra margin. You oversize it to account for the uncertainty and to account for the fact that nobody has done an exact calculation of how this thing is going to work, right? I actually want to read you a definition of a heuristic. Uh, this is from Wikipedia, not a bad definition. A heuristic, uh, quote, is any approach to sol problem solving that employs a pragmatic method that is not fully optimized, perfected, or rationalized, but is nevertheless good enough as an approximation or attribute substitution. 
where finding an optimal solution is impossible or impractical, heuristic methods can be used to speed up the process of finding a satisfactory solutions. Uh, heuristics can be mental shortcuts that ease the cognitive load of making a decision. So the question is, with modernization of the electric grid, will the old heuristics still work? Will our analytic approach still work? Will the models still work? And I could have titled uh, this talk uh, modeling challenges, but I really want to uh, emphasize that this is about an entire way of thinking about a technical system. Uh, that is being called into question, in particular by new types of generation resources like solar and wind, uh, but also more broadly by different kinds of power electronics that are finding their way uh, into uh, in system. And the deeper question here that I think ought to be part of any uh, engineering education is making a decision about when is a model appropriate to use? When is it the right model or not the right model for a given situation, right? All models are wrong. Some models are useful, sometimes under certain circumstances. Um, so the, the question here is, are we turning electric grids into a regime where old models or habitual ways of thinking things or practical solutions for keeping the lights on might not work anymore. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an appetizer sampler of, of uh, examples for how old school approximations and simplifications may become invalid. Michael Ryan still has his hand raised and I don't know if um, oh, the hand is, so hopefully we've addressed uh, the tech problems. Uh, I'm going to start with, um, well, actually, just uh, coming back to this sort of the challenge of inverter-based generation in particular. Um, you know, you will not often find uh, utility executives or um, grid operators who are going to go on camera or in public talking to reporters saying, you know, actually, we don't really understand our system very well. And we are frankly scared as hell of what might happen that we don't know about. But in a sense, that's really what's going on. And it's a piece that in the policy context, you might miss if you're focused on following the money, right? Clearly, there are economic factors, political factors, a lot of reasons why there may be pushback against renewables. But I want you to appreciate that there is also a sense of just very genuine horror at not quite having a complete theoretical grasp of everything that's going on um, and this, this fear of being surprised. So the first thing that you learn in your basic power engineering, uh, electrical engineering curriculum is all about uh, sinusoidal functions and an alternating current is represented by this, uh, you know, sine function, which is fully exactly characterized by three numbers that never change. You have an amplitude, you have a frequency, and you have a phase shift. Um, and that, of course, is an approximation, but we rarely in uh, the engineering curriculum step back to ask ourselves, are there times when that approximation is not useful? Uh, in reality, uh, here are some ways. Uh, you might have harmonic distortion that gives it kind of a funky shape. Uh, you might have transient disturbance events. Uh, this one looks like a fairly minor one. There's bigger ones. Um, there could be, and this is to be expected, uh, a change over time in the frequency um, that we don't model as a, sort of a failure to behave like a sine wave. Well, on the time scale that we're doing the analysis, uh, it's irrelevant that sort of slowly over time we may be, might be shifting from 60.0 to 60.1 cycles per second. Um, but 
if you want to be rigorous and define a frequency, so for example, if you're writing a standard for a measuring instrument, like a phaser measurement unit, and you want to write a standard for how accurate it should be and what is the true or correct frequency that it should calculate, it turns out, well, there is no such thing as a correct frequency of a function of a, a, a time, what is physically just a time series of voltages um, that is not strictly speaking periodic, right? You could define frequency as how long between zero crossings. Um, you could compute a phase angle and, and find the rate of change. You could do Fourier transform, which you would learn about in signal processing, not necessarily in power engineering, you could just do a best fit autocorrelation in time. And if your signal was a pure sinusoid, all those would agree. In reality, they might disagree. So it's actually, I've seen grown men go into get into heated arguments over how you should define frequency in, in such a setting. Um, if you want to write a digital control algorithm for a power electronic device that is supposed to behave in a certain way depending on the frequency, well, how do you tell it to calculate the correct frequency if there's no such thing as a correct frequency? This problem happened. This is not hypothetical. So back in 2016, um, there was an event uh, associated with a fire in the long lines uh, momentarily and as you can see so there's three colors here of, uh, of waveforms so the, the three phases and there were some very abrupt shifts and a number of solar inverters a large number of solar inverters did exactly how, what they were programmed to do and calculated the frequency according to their algorithms and they came out with a number that was less than 57 at which point they had been instructed to disconnect because that probably means something very bad is happening and you should be on the safe side and disconnect. Well, it turns out that we really did not want solar inverters to disconnect because this was a transient disturbance and we really needed them on the grid. There was actually 1,200 megawatts worth of solar, of, of transmission-connected solar that dropped off, nearly caused a massive blackout. There told megawatts more of behind the meter solar that also dropped off and we don't even have good data uh, on that now uh, the north uh, north american uh, electricity uh, electric reliability corporation NERC, calculated the correct frequency during this disturbance as 59.867 hertz i say there is no such correct answer it's a matter of applying a different algorithm but so that what really failed here is not the solar inverters. What failed is a cognitive framework in which the engineers who programmed those inverters thought that, oh, the waveforms are sinusoidal and everybody who agreed on the standards so failed to have the conversation about what about when the system doesn't meet our assumptions. So um, historically, this was not an issue. First of all, there's good reason to expect waveforms to be smooth. We make alternating current with rotate magnets rotating inside copper wires. So um, there's a physical intuition that says the voltage, which is from the rate of change of flux, magnetic flux through this coil, is based on an intuitive analog process. And so that shouldn't have step changes in it. It should be smooth. And in any case, um, a sinusoidal waveform would not be actionable. What are you going to do about it? Um, historically, uh, generators would just absorb in an analog manner uh, shocks or transient disturbances to the system. And they would do so slowly or on a, on a time scale that's mandated by just, again, the analog intuitive physics of the situation. You have a very massive steel that's spinning at a very high rate. So you don't just stop that at an instant, right? This is the, the basis of system inertia um, that uh, 
that has been very important uh, for the intuition of how the electric grid behaves. Now enter uh, power electronics inverters, no rotating parts, no inherent thing in there that one day at 50 or 60 cycles, right? It's all power electronics inside. And it's not just, I want to point out, it's not just the solar and the wind generators, but other power electronics in the grid, other solid state technology. This is a converter station between AC and DC. A lot of loads now are power electronic loads, like a variable frequency drive in here. So these are devices that are based on transistors, circuits with transistors. And, and the, the transistor is, you know, profoundly uh, a device that has a control function separate from the power flow. So we can throw switches at very high speeds. And the way that an inverter uh, nowadays produces what resembles a sinusoidal waveform is with pulse width modulation. Uh, this image is, is exaggerated. There's just a dozen or so steps in here. In reality, uh, there would be thousands. And um, if I'm a light bulb and I look at the waveform, it looks like sinusoidal sinusoidal enough uh, to me, but in reality, there are control decisions um, at very tiny fractions of a second that can be made quite arbitrarily by programming uh, these devices. So this is a completely different um, of physics. One of the things that people are worried about um, in the grid, and this is sort of your, your quintessential um, disturbance event is when there's a loss of a power plant somewhere, how does everything else in the system compensate for that? And how do we keep the lights on? So the point of concern is this nadir or the low point in, in the frequency. Uh, what happens is for a period of a few seconds, if you have a big generator dropping off, but you still have more demand, you have an or you have the same demand that you had before, there's an imbalance between supply and demand, and everything in the system slows down until the active control uh, kicks in and compensates for it. And the question is, how low does it go before it actually trips some protective relays and the lights somewhere? Um, so... This, uh, first of all, this kind of analysis of, of how the system responds is a quasi steady state. Um, we are, uh, you know, acknowledging that the frequency changes, but we are ignoring the fact that if you measure the frequency with a PMU at different locations, it would actually tell you something different at, at a given instance. So there's a simplification here. The question of, well, how should you protect the system? Um, at what frequency should you say, this generator is at risk of being damaged, I'm going to cut it loose from the system, like that decision that the inverters made, you know, at 57 hertz, for example. What I want to emphasize here, that type of policy, control policy that you set, there is not like some set of equations that you can solve and it gives you the correct answer that says, oh, 57 hertz is where you should shut it off. There's engineering judgment that goes into that and it's fuzzy and it's based on some experience of having operated the system. And you're sort of, you know, estimating what would likely be a good control choice. So that's an example of, of a heuristic. Um, now, the way that control kicks in. The way that it works is entirely, traditionally, entirely based on analog processes that are, again, very intuitive and they're local because they had to work before there was even telephones connecting one power plant to the other, right? Um, so the analog, um, really simple James Watt governor here in the upper right, like they use that for steam engines. It's a beautifully design of just centrifugal force pulling those fly balls apart. When it spins too fast, it pulls on a lever, lever that will close down the steam valve to make the steam push less hard. 
and uh, when it's too slow, then those balls come down together. The centrifugal force doesn't pull them out as much, and it'll open the steam valve. So it is a feedback control mechanism, and you can tune it, represented here on, uh, on the droop curve with a slope. It's just a, a, a linear uh, you know, control curve. Um, and setting the, the slope of that is really a, a metric for how aggressively you're controlling the system. There is, there is a number that, that the industry generally embraces, 5% or, you know, at 0.05 per unit. That's a heuristic. It's derived from just experience and knowing, well, that usually works pretty well. There's not a set of equations that you can solve to say this is exactly your optimal control when you have thousands of machines. It turns out that doing droop control with thousands of machines in different places that don't talk to each other actually produces pretty much a stable uh, outcome time. Um, so here we are in the California ISO control room. And these are the guys trying to keep the lights on. And they too are, they have lots of data on their screens, a lot of data. And much of that has changed in the recent decades as they've reconfigured the control room. And all, all around the world, there's, you know, grid operators are now benefiting from more data, especially about weather and demand and status of transmission lines and so forth. But there is still some of the old intuition and heuristics that they're working with. For instance, uh, at what point do they need to be calling an emergency, right? It's a hot afternoon. The load is growing. Maybe some generation is out of service. What's the limit of how, how many megawatts of generation you, reserves you need? What should we expect from the load? Uh, Jim Demers, who used to direct the operations at the Cal so told me that back in the day he used to call his buddy on Beale Street in San Francisco when it was really sort of a white knuckle afternoon it's like are we going to be able to make it through he would ask his buddy to uh, take a look at the flags outside the building and if the flags are flying on the flagpole that means the fog is going to come in and it's going to cool off and we're going to uh, but if the flags are hanging down, then we're in trouble. We got to call an emergency. So that's an example of, um, you know, keeping the lights on uh, with heuristics. And the inertia plays a really important role here in buying operators time uh, for response. Um, there is a sense that with inverter based generation that doesn't intrinsically have inertia, perhaps the sky is falling. No. The sky will fall. Is it 50% solar and wind? Is it 70, 80, 90%? Nobody knows because nobody can write a comprehensive, detailed, dynamic model that will account for everything. Um, now, inverters can actually emulate inertia. They can emulate the behavior of spinning machines. You just need to add some storage and you need to write the problem is, well, what algorithms exactly do we want to write? Um, in fact, inverters can not just emulate generators, they could do better because there's an advantage here in the fast response and the controllability. You can avoid some of the downsides of traditional generators. Uh, traditional generators oscillate. And we learn this in the standard power engineering curriculum, there's a swing equation. Uh, we don't do the math for a whole network, but you can do it on a slide rule more or less for a single, the simple, simplified case of a single machine um, on an infinite bus. Um, and uh, we know that, okay, after a disturbance, there's going to be this ring down, that is the, the generator angle is going to oscillate and then settle to its, uh, its equilibrium position. Now, this is 
a liability for the system, but it's also the devil we know as opposed to the devil we don't know. Or at least it's the devil we thought we knew until uh, it turned out that with novel measurements, uh, with PMUs in the 1990s, uh, it was found that there's actually a lot more of this oscillation than anybody had anticipated. So here we have in a rough outline, again, this curve of a, of a nadir after the loss of some major generation. But we see within that these generators, which in this case are different places, different sides of Texas, um, they are swinging against each other. And there are clearly interactions here that are more than just a single generator with an infinite network. It, they are interacting. And we now know, having installed more PMUs all around uh, the grid in the U.S., and other countries are doing this, um, we now know that there are actually oscillation modes that kind of continually exist, and we need to monitor them, and we need to constrain our power transfer so as not to uh, stretch these oscillations out. This was a big aha moment. Uh, in fact, in 1996, um, I remember sitting in my living room when the lights went out, um, and I asked myself, what the hell just happened? It turns out the operators in the control room were asking, what the hell just happened? Nobody had any idea that there were thousands of megawatts sloshing back and forth north and south after there had been some transmission lines uh, out and some hydro generation was out in the Pacific Northwest. And so at the California Oregon Interchange or COI, um, there were underdamped oscillation, is this red line. That's what actually was flowing and then tripped a relay that said, this looks bad. Um, and the lights went out all over the Western uh, US. The models had not captured that because the models were not including these phenomena to, to predict this sort of thing. Now, I want to emphasize this predated a lot of renewables. Right? Back in the 90s, we didn't have a lot of renewables yet uh, on the Western grid. But it was one of those moments, like in the horror movie, when you realize, wow, the shark has been swimming below me, below the, in the murky water this whole time. Or like, you know, the alien pops out of their chest. And it's like, oh, it's been in there and we were not aware of it. Right? It was a terrifying moment for people in the industry uh, wondering, geez, what else is there that we know about? Um, it, so the, the models that were in the way of thinking about the system was no longer apt. Um, the way that we are taught in the basic power engineering uh, curriculum to think about stability is again with with approximations that are suitable for pencil and slide rule calculation we assume a lossless transmission line so we get a relationship between power transfer uh, and the the timing of the voltage phase angle um, that's stretched across the, the two ends of the transmission line, that's this angle delta. And we say, well, okay, there's a theoretical limit at 90 degrees where the curve peaks, that sign of the angle peaks. But somewhere in the middle really is a practical operating limit because as you get closer to the theoretical limit, things get more wobbly and you will tend to have more pronounced oscillations, less damping between the generators. There is no exact set of equations for this, right? We can observe it empirically. People are now trying to write more comprehensive models for this. Uh, but the, the operating heuristics are like, well, okay, we have maybe 45 degrees. Or based on the experience or based on observing oscillations, um, there will be some rules of thumb for an operation you shouldn't go beyond. And the question is, well, um, what happens when everything is inverter-based generation? Do those old rules of thumb apply? Maybe the inverters can do better. I mean, in fact, the converter stations for uh, the, the high-voltage DC line, actually, there, there's work on controlling it to, um, to do oscillation damping actively because then control it at a fast enough uh, rate that it could basically do like noise-canceling headphones. 
right, to counteract the swings. Um, this is a completely different way of thinking about um, controlling devices on the grid. Um, you may avert your gaze if the power flow equations uh, don't evoke uh, joy. Um, but the main, main point here is to say that just even power flow through a network, AC power flow, uh, is literally complex. We use complex numbers uh, to make it uh, workable. But it's a problem that we today do with computers. Um, if you specify power injections at different locations and, you know, supply and demand, and then ask the question, how much power is going to flow on a given transmission line? And so somebody got okay to schedule, um, you actually have to solve that numerically through a simulate an iterative process of basically simulating um, the power flow. Uh, back in the day, it, Power flow was done literally in a with a DC analog model where you would measure voltages and currents like a, a small scale um, replica of the system as by nature approximate. But so if we want to drive the system close to its limits for economic reasons, uh, we want to do this more closely. Now this problem doesn't fundamentally change whether you have renewables, but what the introduction of renewables does is it increases the number of nodes where power is being injected. And it also means that the, uh, the behavior over time doesn't follow exactly all the rules that you're accustomed to. I want to just briefly uh, get a little bit into the distribution system, which you know, traditionally, one of the assumptions was that, oh, you can separate high voltage transmission from the local medium voltage distribution, different math, different operations staff, different division of the organization, right? Um, there, because from the substation on down, uh, you could assume there's one way power flow outward to the customers. Um, you would assume that the three phases are in balance. And you could design essentially based on the maximum load. So you have a design envelope and you look at the peak load. You look at the worst case fault current. If, you know, a tree falls on the power line, fault occurs. And then knowing that you've designed the system to be okay at those for those parameters, you can pretty much rest assured that it will be okay anywhere in between. You, there was not a need for careful monitoring uh, of anything at the distribution level because there was nothing actionable really and you had designed it kind of for the worst case situation. Now, these assumptions are changing. In particular, the one-way power flow is changing with uh, generation out on the circuit. Um, also, with you know heavy, for instance, EV charging loads, um, the assumption of three phases being balanced is no longer necessarily a good one uh, because you could get unlucky and have very grave imbalances with solar on one circuit and EVs on the other on, on a single phase residential uh, setting. So um, for accurately modeling distribution systems and asking the question, what is going to, is it okay to even interconnect the stuff or do we need to do a physical upgrade here? Uh, you really need to take into account uh, all three phases detail. Um, one of the big, uh, you know, a big part of a distribution engineer's job is to lay the system out in such a way that the voltage is always going to be good within the range of plus or minus 5%. So if the voltage at your house is nominally 120 volts, you want it to be between um, 114 and 126, and then all of your appliances are going to be happy. Now, very few utilities actually measure voltage in your neighborhood. Uh, in fact, when smart meters were rolled out, they were designed to, even though they voltage, not 
to communicate it, um, not to use up communication bandwidth because it wasn't thought to be that important operationally. Uh, it turns out when you have big variable loads and generation distribution systems, uh, you actually want to keep more careful track of the voltage because it can go up and down, right? There were heuristics for what is the slope, how many miles, how many customers, for, you know, how many megawatts can you go? And that slope is going to change over time, change as clouds come over, uh, change with the solar generation. Now, you can recruit solar inverters to actively help maintain the voltage. And the one way that has been written into uh, the standard, IEEE standard, is with droop curves. Remind you of anything? So this droop curve is conceptually very much like control for frequency regulation for generators. Right? It's just linear. And how do you decide on these slopes and where do you put the corners of the piecewise linear functions? Heuristics, right? Nobody knows exactly how to optimize that. Um, Systems with many inverters will probably be stable under most situations with, uh, you know, control. But there are not really comprehensive theoretical guarantees. And when you look very carefully at what grid voltage actually does, it turns out there is a whole life under the surface that we didn't even know about. This is using the grid sweep instrument. Um, which is a very high precision uh, measurement that's uh, sampling at 4.3 kilohertz. And it's showing content uh, in the waveform at the subsynchronous frequencies, in this case from zero to 35 hertz. And there's disturbance events, there's uh, some artifacts, there's probably something that the loads are doing. And we're looking here at a time series um, of, you know, 45 minutes or so. And there's stuff that we don't even know what it is. I'm going to show you another example. Um, and this has been raised by some of the utilities who are seeing uh, some of these signatures show up when the solar inverters are on and not so much when the solar inverters are off. It's possible that there are interactions between and among the control loops of inverters, which would be completely avoidable if we knew what the interactions are and how to program the inverters to avoid them. But ignorance, we don't really know what to tell them to do. So there's a potential for instability, also a potential for unstable interaction between the inverters and the legacy voltage control equipment where you're changing taps on transformers or voltage regulators or you're turning capacitors on and off. Um, and really controlling these diverse devices with a co coherent strategy is not something anyone has actually done. So very briefly, because I think we want to finish up here, Mm. protection. This is a big deal in power distribution. Uh, lines fall over, trees fall over. Uh, you want to have fuses or circuit breakers that isolate the dangerous parts that are maybe act with something or start fires or whatnot. It is an art and a science to coordinate the different fuses and circuit breakers such that the device that's upstream from wherever the problem is, is the one to actuate first. So you have these time current curves and you align them and compare them to see, you know, if something at the very end of the circuit has a problem, then you want the fuse in that yellow box to be the one to trip. If it's upstream from the orange one, uh, to well, the fuse would melt. Um, and so each device has its zone that it's responsible for. And this entire way of thinking about protection is based on the assumption of one-way power flow. So when you have reverse power flow, you will have to coordinate your protective devices differently. In fact, there's even uh, an issue with, you know, what is the fault current? So 
calculations that protection engineers do is they try and estimate, well, how much current, how do you tell the difference between just a high load versus something that's an unsafe condition? And telling that difference when the inverters are feeding in current is not as obvious because it might not be as much current to help you recognize a fault. So the protection and the voltage management are some of the key issues that, um, you know, make utilities concerned about having too much solar on a circuit. Uh, there may also not be enough capacity for just adding more loads. Uh, an electric vehicle charger can basically double the load of a single family household. So, you know, the, the investor on utilities in California were required to publish these maps that show you basically um, how much capacity is, integration capacity is there. That's essentially at what point would you have to do a circuit upgrade or at least do a much more careful study to see how much solar or additional load you could uh, incorporate. And those interconnection studies are labor intensive, time consuming, expensive, and really kind of a bottleneck. Uh, and the, the, a similar thing is true at the transmission level too. But you can appreciate the engineers are like, well, move slow here because we don't know at what point we're gonna have problems. And the best we can do right now is come up with a heuristic for when we think we're okay and when we might not be okay, so we need to do more careful uh, studies. And I don't have to tell you that that's uh, approximate. So the upshot, and these are kind of all the examples of assumptions or approximation heuristics I've sprinkled throughout the talk, uh, the question is, at what point are these assumptions challenged by new uh, generation resources, by new control devices, and also by having different locations than uh, were you know, in play uh, in, in the accustomed environment? Um, what we need is more models that take into account more of the detailed dynamics. Those models need to be validated with data, so we need more actual empirical measurements. Um, the analogy here, the batting cage, is that, you know, in operations, the way that you learn to do things is by practicing. There are things, you're not going to stand there and do in your head like V naught T minus G squared, right? You're, you have to practice and learn empirically what works and what doesn't work. So we need simulations, realistic simulations uh, of grid behaviors that account for all of the physics that are in it. The difference, and this is where the, the baseball analogy breaks down, um, you can train really effectively in a batting cage and, and the batting it's going to be the same thing, right? Whether you're playing a real game or you have a person or a machine tossing you the ball. Um, for the electric grid, right, you can't really practice, you can't really train on the, on the real system because you would be at the risk of, you know, making people's lights go out or worse, causing fires and killing people. So you can't, you don't have the liberty of experimenting in the, but we don't really have a full scale simulator where you can move fast and break things. Right. Um, so I think we need to move in the direction of having more comprehensive simulation. Um, and that will require really a lot of creative work um, and a lot of different skill sets that I think need to be brought to bear on uh, sort of figuring out how do we represent some of these different, um, these different attributes, these different behaviors? How do we tease out um, what might otherwise surprise us? Um, so I think we need a lot of different talent uh, in this field. So this is my last slide. Um, one reason that I wrote this book, which took a very long time, is because I want to make uh, 
electric power engineering at least qualitatively more accessible data scientists, software experts, um, policy experts, economists, environmental scientists, people should have a working knowledge of the electric grid. And so in my book, the, this is like the first and last stop of my book tour, the global book tour, Palo Alto. Um, you can, um, the qualitative parts, you can skip the math if you want to, but there's also math in it if you want to, want to actually do it. So I'll take a couple of questions. 